Good morning, Christ Church. Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday morning on the most wonderful hour of our week, the way we get to start off this calendar week, the time of praise, the time of worship, with the time of being together as the body of Christ. Today we're going to talk about, um, in our scripture, it's going to be talking about the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15. Uh, songs and, and of praise and, and songs of lament and songs of other types of things are, are spread through all, all of scripture, uh, and it's important. Songs are, are ways in which we'll talk about earlier of, of how we express both um, what's going on in our heads, what's going on in our hearts, what's going on um, throughout our lives, and connecting all of those things together in an expression uh, to God. And so I invite you, as we start off our worship service, and just kind of a, maybe a little bit of an introduction that we don't always do of why do we sing to begin with? Well, because it, it connects us, it centers us, it brings us, and it engages us fully into the worship of God. And so I invite you, as we start off our service, to join us in singing and in worship. you to stand and sing with us. I lost my spot, so there we go. Sharon's following along because she's so great. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's i 
this time, I'm inviting Kevin up for a time of confession, and I invite you all to have a seat. Please. Members of Christ Church, uh, on behalf of the consistory, we want to confess to you things that God has shown us that we've done wrong. When we approved the plan for missional communities, we asked everyone who desires to be a member to affirm or reaffirm their membership. What we didn't communicate is that a recommitment was not required to continue to be in membership at Christ Church. We were wrong not to do that, not to communicate that clearly. We know that we hurt you by allowing your status as members of Christ Church to be uncertain. And if you did not choose to recommit, if, if you didn't choose to recommit, and we're very sorry for the pain that we've caused you. As a result of what we did not do, we know that we need to repair the relationships that we've damaged. To reformat the way we do our sign-up for missional communities and to clarify our communications regarding the membership going forward, we humbly ask for your forgiveness. If you'd like to discuss this later, uh, your consistory members are me, Samantha Pohl, Carol Riddle, Russ Tharp, um, Paul Moore, and Keith Ackerman. Thank you. The great thing is that God is so great. He forgives us and so after that time of confession from our church, we hope you can use this time to remind yourself of how great God is and stand and sing if you would like to stand, you're welcome to.
Um, as usual at this time, um, since school has started back up, we use this opportunity to really live out our mission statement to be the presence of Christ. And one of the ways that we do this is to pack bags for kids at the local elementary school. Um, and so during this five minute break, it's time, it's your time, um, but we do hope that you'll help us to pack some bags over there. So see you back in five minutes.
headed back to your seats. Got a few announcements to talk about. Number one on the slate that we got coming up is the congregational meeting happening on the 22nd. So two weeks from today, after church on Sunday, we'll have a congregational meeting. We do this every single year that we present our budget, how we use uh, the tithes that um, our members give and for the purpose of God. And so we'll present that to you uh, and invite time for discussion and, and feedback as we look to affirm what we're doing for the next year with um, our finances. Next, after the Sunday, after the service today, we're going to continue on. The fellowship team is putting on the second Sunday social, which they have done for several months now. This week, instead of a meet at somebody's house, it's going to be here, and uh, it's going to be upstairs. So after the service, if you would like to join us, invite anyone to join us, go ahead and head upstairs, and let's spend some time together, have some food, have some fellowship, and uh, break bread, which is what God calls us to do with each other. So I invite you to be here, do that after the service today. Next week, <laughs> next week, we are going to uh, do a little movie screen of a, of a movie that one of our own members has been a, was a very large part of, um, and so that's going to be on Saturday. I invite you to come be a part of that um, with our very own Tom Oakroft. All right. Uh, let's see. Next, one more thing. Next week, we have missional communities. Uh, so... Uh, during the service, we'll do what we typically do every third Sunday, which is have a little bit of a shortened service and then set aside some time to meet as missional communities. Uh, maybe one announcement for that is this is kind of every three months in a cycle we try to do, well, what we do is we have all the missional communities meet together as a time of kind of saying, sharing and, and talking through what each other are doing. And, and this week we're also going to take, or the next week we'll also take some time to kind of review. How's it going? What do we think about it? What's, uh, what do we want to is there anything we want to do differently? Is there things that are going well? How, you know, kind of what's the temperature and how are we feeling about this now? We've been doing it for five months. So really would love to have your voice there. Come and be bold with what you have to say. Be very honest with that, what you want to have to say because this is kind of the time in the meeting in which we talk about if we want things to change, right? So not a time to be uh, hesitant or bashful. Please be bold in the spirit. So uh, let's, and then... Tomorrow, I believe, we have the next food distribution. So, um, invite you to come be a part of that. This has been a, a wonderful blessing in our community. Fed, you know, thousands upon thousands of pounds of food to families. Thousands upon thousands of families have received food from this. And our parking lot fills up completely before we even start handing out food because people really value that and really need it this time. So, I invite you to come and be a part of that time, that ministry. Uh, as we address food insecurity here in St. Charles. All right, as always, if you have any questions about anything uh, that we have talked about today, anything that, uh, any of these announcements, I invite you to go to go.celebrating.org slash info. There'll be more information about those there, and if you can't find it there, or if you don't have internet access, feel free to talk to me, or anyone on consistory, or Jenny when she's in the office. All right. Let's take some time uh, to continue on in our worship service with the most, with the most uh, wonderful privilege that we could ask for, the God of the universe, the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, who is over all and in all and through all, wants to talk to us, wants to listen to us, cares about what's going on in our lives and in our world. And so let us take some time and pray. Dear Lord. Father, we come to you on this Sunday, uh, at the beginning of a new year, um, having gone through the holidays, having gone through celebrations, and now looking forward to uh, a calendar set out in front of us. Lord, we pray as a church, uh, as we think through, as we talk through, as we walk through and decide what we want to do in this year, what we want to do in these coming seasons, here in winter, and then in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, in the winter again that you would bless our church, you would give us wisdom, you would give us discernment, you would give us uh, a calling um, and a deep conviction of your gospel. Lord, we have neighbors all around us. We have people all around us who you've called us to love, to show your presence, your love, your wonderfulness to. And then we even have, uh, by your providence, an entire set of apartments getting set up and that will, people will start moving into later this year. Lord, what an opportunity what an opportunity to love. What an opportunity to, to go forth, to reach out to people moving into a new place and then all of the changes that that will come and will make that we can get to be a part of, that we get to come alongside people with, that we get to be good neighbors. 
right from the beginning. And Lord, I ask for your help. I ask for the boldness in sharing your gospel, the boldness in proclaiming the good news and ministering to it, not in a way, um, uh, in a winsome way, let's just put it that way, Lord, in a way that uh, calls people to you, that is, shines a light into darkness that people would want to come to and to experience you. Father, we pray, um, yeah, we pray for our city. Uh, we pray for the police chief um, of St. Louis City as he takes on a new job and takes on a hard job. And Father, we pray as, uh, as a city and county work to uh, distribute a whole lot of funds that are coming in from uh, uh, the settlement with the Rams, that uh, that money can do a lot. Uh, that is a, a lot of opportunity there. But Lord, you're the one who makes things happen. Uh, money can be spent, money can be used in many different ways, but Lord, unless it has your blessing, unless it's done after a desire, after with your heart and with the desire to uplift and to help, um, then it's meaningless. And so, Father, may you be a part of that discussion. May our leaders desire to love and desire to care and have wisdom and discernment uh, in pursuing, pursuing uh, you. In the, in the use of funds. Lord, we pray for our nation. Um, we pray for our governance. Lord, there's a lot, been a lot, of, uh, <laughs> a lot of conflict in votes, a lot of conflict in deciding leadership in our Congress. Lord, we pray for governors and, gov- and congressmen and women who desire to love your people, who desire to love this nation and do good. Um, Lord, we pray that you would You would help them not to be there for selfish reasons, not to look only at what's in front of them, but, Lord, to have your eyes, your ears, and your heart to govern this nation well. Father, once again, I come back here to us, to Christ Church. Those of us who are going through sickness and illness, through through discomfort, disease, mourning, grieving, times of uncertainty, times of depression, and times of joy. May you be a constant presence, Prince of Peace, a wonderful counselor through our lives, and may we together seek you in the kingdom of God. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We've been going through the book of Exodus, and we're going to continue on today. So I invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 15, starting in verse 1, going through verse 21, and a little bit of, as you turn there, a little bit of an um, introduction into where we are. So God has just done one of the most famous stories in the Bible. He parted the Red Sea. He brought the Israelites across safely, and then he swallowed up the Egyptian army, the superpower of the day, all without the Israelites needing to lift a finger. All they did was pack up and walk and follow, and it was... A singularly amazing thing. And so here we come now to Exodus chapter 15, right after all of these events have happened, right after people saw the great power of the Lord, feared and believed in him. And then in verse chapter 15, verse 1, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They were down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, woe-doing wonders? You outstretched out your right hand, the earth 
swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by by whom you have purchased, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and with all the women went out after her, all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing, and Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Let's pray, dear Lord. What a beautiful song, what a wonderful scripture. What an incredible exaltation of praise. Lord, as we dig in, as we study, as we consider this song of Moses and of Miriam, work in our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Show us the application. Show us your scripture and its movement and its working in our lives here today and let us appreciate and understand what you were doing even back all those thousands of years ago. Father, I pray that as I preach that you would help me, that I could, my words here would edify your people, would glorify you, and where I am wrong, that you would correct me. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Three years ago, yeah, in 2019, when the Blues won the Stanley Cup, our city erupted in celebration. Parade, speeches, ceremony, car horns honking all around. What was the most widely form of celebration? What is always going to be associated with the Stanley Cup? Gloria! The song blaring, glowing, uh, being played on the radio station for 24 hours a day on repeat, singing. Because there's this need to celebrate, there's this need to sing, this expression of emotion that nothing else can quite capture. This, uh, this momentum, that song that had been with the blues throughout the playoffs. And then as they won, finally, it was this reminder, this celebration, this praise that none of us could otherwise quite put into words, but it brought us all together in this singular joy that it was to have a hockey team win the Stanley Cup championship. These themes of joy, of celebration, of wonder, and singing, they go forth. We see it here in our scripture today. And we're called to sing praises to the Lord, for he he has done something even far greater than the Stanley Cup. He saved us from death. All right, so if we sing about Gloria and we sing a wonderful pop song and whatnot for the, in a Stanley Cup, what do, what do we sing about when we're considering our God? This seems like a bit of a daunting task. There's a lot more to consider here. There's a lot more going on there. Well, number one, let's, talk, let's look at our scriptures for today. We can sing of his triumph over evil. Right from the very beginning, we sing to the Lord, he has triumphed gloriously and we detail all the ways in which he's done it he's thrown the horse and his rider into the sea he's overcome pharaoh and his chariots he's overcome the enemy who was glorifying in their own strength and their own ability that's in the size of of their army and yet when come against the glory of god there was no comparison and in a far greater way in a far greater way, what we have gotten to see today, that just as Exodus was so formative in the nation of Israel's history and their understanding of who God was, of what he would do, of his capability and of what his glory was in comparison to the other gods in the world, in comparison to the armies of the world, so we have seen something far, far greater. For the, the one, the accuser, the one who hates us, the one who comes against us and tempts us in, in every single way. Satan, he brought his glory against God. He brought the fullness of his glory. He put God to death. And yet God glory, God's glory was greater even than death, even than the greatest thing that our adversary could come and put against us. God, God conquered death. 
God gained victory over death. And because of him, death is no longer the end of the story. There is no eternal death for those who are in him. And for that, that we sing. That is why we start off our services and songs. That is why we come to him with uh, everything that is on our minds, our hearts, and our bodies, because, because he's done everything. This past Friday, uh, me and my friends did a tradition that we've been doing here for about six years. Um, We celebrated the Feast of Stephen. We're about 10 days, we were about 10 days too late uh, according to our calendar and about three days too early according to Eastern Orthodox calendar. Uh, but nonetheless, that was the time we could come together. So we came together and we, we celebrated the Feast of Stephen. And the way that we do this is um, we, we get together, we, we make some Feuerzangenbola. If you know, if you've been to a Christmas jer- market in Germany, you know what I'm talking about. You, a, little, a little wine, a little fire. It's a glorious, fun, warm, toasty time. And then we sing the wonderful carol and ballad Good King Wenceslas. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. And we don't, most, there, well, there's one guy in our entire group who knows all of the words, all of the verses, everything in there. And he plays the ukulele and he sings it out. And the rest of us pretty much only know on the feast of Stephen. And so we'll sing it and we'll say, Good King Wenceslas looked out. Everybody together on the feast of Stephen. Da, 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 on the feast of Stephen. <laughs> right? And it just keeps going and going. And we keep repeating ourselves um, because that's the part we know, but we still enjoy, we glorify, we love the song. And I think that's a little bit of what's going on here with, Mer- with Miriam as they go out with the tambourines with everyone. They say, and she says, Sing to the Lord for his triumph gloriously. The horse and the rider is thrown into the sea. It's the first part of the song that we're introduced to you into chapter 15. And it's kind of the chorus. And you can just see her calling out and her and all the women in front dancing with tambourines. And they call it out and they say, Sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider they have thrown into the sea. And everybody else who knows the song echoes back. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And a back and forth, and again, and continuously, and as they march, as they have just witnessed this glorious spectacle of the Lord destroying the superpower's army without them having to do anything. So they echo back in song and praise, and it comes forward. Oh. And it is a scene of celebration. It's a scene of joy. And then as they end the song, as I come down to the end of the song, so you see this, this singing of his triumph over evil. And not only do that, then they go into, they go into his future triumphs. They go and they, they detail the people of Philistia, the, the chiefs of Edom, the leaders of Moab, the inhabitants of Canaan, they all melt away, and it's this preview. It's this preview of what God is about to do, of what we get to um, go on. And this is a whole other sermon, but I'll talk about it ever so briefly because it's fun. Uh, as the Israelites were going into Canaan, when you read that story, as the people of God are following God, as they were going on in front of him, they have all of these great tribes and fierce warriors and big giants and fortified walls and all of these things. And God goes before them. And the people that are living in these places, they're fleeing before a battle is ever fought. Or if they do stay, God doesn't call the Israelites to go and use their arms. No, he has them march around a wall. Until they sin. Until they stop following God. And then things get messy and complicated. But, again, sermon for another day. We talked about this at the men's retreat several years ago. But now, when they are following God, when they are doing as they call, when God is leading them with the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, and uh, though not always great, when they hear this admonition from Moses to see what the Lord is going to do for you and shut up, just listen and watch. Oh, they get to sing in this glorious manner. of what God has done, of who God is, that he's their God and of what he's going to do for them. And even greater than that, there at the very last verse of the song, the Lord will reign forever and ever. We sing of his triumph over evil and even greater along with that. You can't just say the sing of it once. No, you sing about how he will, his salvation is for all of eternity. Sing of the eternity of his salvation. 
We must sing praises to the Lord, and, and for he has saved us. And what do we sing about? We sing about his triumphs over evil, and we sing about the eternity of his salvation. In verse 18, as we highlighted, the Lord will reign forever and ever, meaning that his triumphs are not once, or not twice, or not a couple times back in, in history. No, his triumphs are for all of eternity. And we get further uh, testimony to that. In Revelation chapter 15, and verse 3, the angels come and they sing. And what do they sing? They sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. This is the song of Moses. This is the song that in, uh, together with the song of the Lamb weave together the, the fullness of salvation, the fullness of God's story of redemption throughout Scripture is sung by the angels in heaven. Because this is proper praise. This is praise to the Lord of what he's done. Because just like uh, how in St. Louis, Gloria is always going to be associated with the Stanley Cup. In our minds, at least those, for those of us who were there, who experienced it, who went through it, whenever that song comes on, there's always going to be a reminder of that joyous week-long celebration and the constant playing of that song. Uh, so also will this song of Moses continue and always remind his Israel, remind his people of the glory of God of what he's done, of his triumphs over evil, and how his triumphs are not just for once, but for all time, for all of eternity, which came to fruition in Christ. Through what he did on the cross, through when he died, through when Satan thought that he had glory, when Satan thought he had overcome and defeated God, but he had not, for Jesus died for our sins so that we would no longer face the penalty of eternal death. And then, not only that, he defeated the glory of death. For he was risen, and he lives, and with him, so then also we live again today. And so maybe to, to dig in a little bit, so why do we sing? Why is sing? Because I, I just read this, right? I read these verses that wasn't really singing, because we don't know the song, we don't know the rhythm, we don't know the beats, we don't know the accompaniment that goes along to this song. Uh, but it's still important to sing, and singing in the songs that we have in here today uh, Jerome, if you could put up verse 21 up on the screen. I want to do a, maybe a little exercise with us. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Danita. Um, read this with me, if you would. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Well, let's, let's read it one more time. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Now, could you take that off the screen for a second? Anyone feel confident repeating that? <laughs> exactly, there's a thing when we just say something, right? There, you can almost feel that there's a bit of a rhythm and beat. You can even in English, right? The translators did a wonderful job in, in making those two lines rhyme. There's a rhyme, there's a rhythm, there's a beat, but just in saying it, it's not memorable. It doesn't stick with us. In fact, as we kind of read it, as what often happens when we read things together as a congregation, it's kind of slow. It's a little plodding. We're all just kind of waiting to say things together. But, and so we're going to try this, and uh, we need tambourines. So put, if you would put the verse back up on the screen. All right, so here's, um, this is very simple because uh, I'm not um, necessarily a composer, nor am I the greatest of musicians that ever lived. Um, but let's just put a small beat to it. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Let's go. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Again, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Come on, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Get into it. Sing to the Lord, he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. All right, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. All right, well done. 
Good job. A simple beat, a simple rhythm, not even that great of a melody. So much more fun, so much more memorable because singing, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5, it engages the heart. As we know through science, it engages both halves of the brain and engages our hearts, our emotions. It engages the full body. It is an expression of praise that is so visceral, so tangible, and I don't even necessarily have the great words for it because I don't know the psychology of it, but there's something about singing, about a beat, about rhythm that is just so much more appropriate when singing something like this. All right, I'm gonna, let's, <laughs> we'll go out on a limb here. Danita, you want to take it off the screen? Anyone feel confident saying, repeating what it was? Together, here we go. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The Lord is this rider, he is thrown into the sea. Look at that, well done. Good job, well done, good on you. Oh, Christ Church, we sing to the Lord for that. If we did not sing, scripture says, the rocks, the trees, all of creation would sing out his praises. We sing for the Lord. He has saved us. He has triumphed over evil, and his eternity is for all of salvation. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you that we can be here today and we can be assured of what you've done, that you have saved us that we can see the works and the wonders that you would go to for the nation of Israel, see that you would give yourself, you would come on off of the throne of heaven to be one of us, to be with us, to share and know our suffering and our burdens, and then to take all of our sins upon you and to die for us so that we, we would not have to face your wrath and death on our own. But instead, Lord, you have given us eternal life, which we have now here today. Oh, Lord, we sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, Lord. Christ Church, we celebrate this here at the table. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Let this be a celebration and in the same manner, after they had supped, he took a cup and he poured it out, saying, this is my blood poured out for you as a new covenant. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. We serve an open table here at Christ Church, meaning if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come and eat, come and drink with us. The bread is gluten-free, so if you have a, a sensitivity, please feel free to join us. And we serve both wine and grape juice, with the wine being the rosé in the middle of the tray. So please take what is appropriate for you. The table is ready. Come and eat. Come and drink.
King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Let us adore him, not just here, but as we go forth. Uh, a couple of words as we go. One, um, we have a potluck going on upstairs. I invite you to join with us, have some time for f- food and fellowship. Two, uh, wanted to just kind of remind the call and the invitation that Kevin put forth. Uh, our consistory, we have together confessed to you that we have done wrong. We have um, not... Uh, we did not treat and communicate uh, the, the, how we were handling or how our church is handling membership well. And we know that that has hurt a lot of people and, uh, and both feeling maybe as second-class members or not understanding and knowing where their membership felt. And that's not a, what we were called to do as the governing body of the church. And so uh, if you want, you'd like to talk about this with us, feel free to come talk to, to me, Kevin, 
or any of the other members of the consistory, uh, if you'd like to read this statement or hear it again, we sent it out in the newsletter. It is on the website at ghost.celebrating.org slash info, I believe. It's not. It's just on the newsletter. It can be. <laughs> we'll put it on there. All right. Thank you. Um, but we, uh, yeah, we, uh, we sincerely offer our, our confession, and we ask for your forgiveness. And as, with that, as we both uh, worship our God, as we come forward in this regular pattern of repentance, which characterizes the gospel, which is what it is all about, um, so we go forth, and I invite you and call you to go forth with the love of our Father, with the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.